You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I was wild in 94, 95, like wild. There was a bouncer on the back door of Camden Palace. Um, it was alleged that I ran up to him. Um, I tried to shoot him with a sawn off shotgun. Prison for me was just non-stop conflict with the screws. When you are prepared, when you, you, you or anybody else, when you personally are prepared to die, to go to prison forever, to get stabbed, get shot, get beaten for that other person. Like, that's what I'm gonna get, it's gonna, I'm gonna accept that for you. Jumps up, she said, yo, you go to sleep tonight, cunt, and you're getting a pee eye in your face as soon as you go to sleep, you might as well do something about it, do it now, you cunt. All the fellas have come out of the wing with tools and uh, expecting us all to run off. Yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then you're like, yeah, let's go, let's go. Have you had a time in your life where you were ex gonna accept to be getting life at some point? Yeah, I was gonna get life. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just, it's happening, isn't it? You get nicked for them shootings, that like, you're either getting not guilty or you're going away forever. Boom, we're on. Back. Yes, mate, part two. We've got the brother on, Marvin Herbert. There we go. How are you? Yeah, really good. You know, it's a... Uh, I must say, it's quite surprising the amount of attention or sort of acknowledgement I've had through my story, you know, it's quite amazing to see there's so many people interested in that journey, you know. And it's, uh, it's kind of a blessing, you yeah. know. So it opened my eyes a little bit on lots of things, to be honest with you, James. It's a phenomenal story, and I told you that after we'd done it, it's one of the best, if not the best, podcast I've ever done. The, mo the roller coaster of emotion from speaking about the pain of your past, your mum, your dad. You clearly wear your heart on your sleeve. It was, um, it was, yeah, it was such a powerful podcast. It's one of the most viewed in the UK this month. Over three hundred thousand views, Man, over a quarter of a million downloads. It's been mega. Obviously, you're the quickest guy I've had on for a part two. It's, um, yeah, it was a phenomenal story. We never, we, we never even touched the surface. Yeah, yeah, We've not yeah. even scratched the surface. So many people. I know a lot of people. I've had a lot of people on the show. I know who's the real deal and who's not. You're clearly the real deal. Everybody speaks very highly of you. Says you're a fucking psychopath, which I believe it's is crazy, true. It? Yeah. I, I feel when when I, even just hearing that makes me feel a little bit emotional. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like because to me, my journey has just been that. It's just been a journey. It's just been what I've had to do. But when I sort of reflect back and I think about things. It, I can't say it's traumatising that, but it's like, wow, like, how could you think like that? Do you know what I mean? Like, the mindset I used to have, the, the constant insanity, you know, and it's just reflecting on it all now makes me sort of realise now, rather than, like, before when people said to me, oh, you're a lunatic, you're now, I just think, he's a fucking idiot, he don't know what he's talking about, I'm just normal doing what I'm doing. But like, res re retrospectively now, looking back, I just think, wow, like how insane I was, you know, like, and that normalization of that behavior is just what's made me realize how sort of, how much of an impact my journey's making. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because I was insane, like, like I was insane, yeah. like, in, like, even just, just the crazy things I used to think about, like, on the podcast. I'm not trying to be anything. Like people that know me know me, right? People that listen, uh, listen. People that have been in contact with me or been in environments with me know I don't pretend. Do you know what I mean? I'll just do what needs to be done, and I'll just I'm honest. And maybe that's been one of my flaws that got me into a lot of trouble because I'll tell someone when they're a cunt. I'll tell someone when I think they're stupid. I'll tell someone when they think they're making a mistake. I'll tell someone when, when I think they're wrong. You know, I'm not one to hold my mouth. I wouldn't do it. Well, I have done it in a way where I've actually made people listen. Do you know what I'm saying? You? When it's just all part of the mindset, the transition, of where we're going. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to put my story out there in ways 
that people can understand me as a person. You know, because everyone listens to a reputation. Everyone listens to a story. Everyone listens to a tale. But no one really listened to the people, you know. And although I'm not proud of the person that I was, you know, I'm proud of getting through what I got through, you know, because I know that it, it's took a lot. Mm -hmm. It really has took a lot. And I know a lot of men, a lot of people would have broke a lot sooner or not me made it 20 percent through my life you know but the, the one message i like to give everybody is never give up and i'm living proof of that although i made it and the word i was looking for last time was an oxymoron i mean i became a successful criminal but i amounted to nothing and i was the best criminal at what i'd done where i was doing it so I became very successful in what I'd done and how I'd done it, but I amounted to nothing. And it was that that resonated with me into realising I've always wanted to become something mm -hmm. and I made it to the highest level in the criminal fraternity and I didn't feel like I'd achieved anything. So I needed to go to higher levels and higher frequencies and, and that's where I'm going right now, you yeah. know. How good was it to feel when you opened up yourself up to be vulnerable, talk about your story, f to be getting so much love and attention now for people to accept you for who you are and what you've came from to what you're doing now. Um, Were you surprised? I was, I was, I was really surprised. I was really surprised, not at the amount of views. I was surprised at the comments. You know, that was really... It's hard to explain. Like, when you're always told that you're no value or you're shit or you're no good or you're a fucking problem, you're this, you're that, you're this, or there's nothing positive comes our way. You know, the only thing that comes positive your way is when another criminal thanks you for doing something. You know, but the whispers you hear, the stories you hear, like, where the boogeymen, where the bad people, when you grow up sort of. massaging that into your belief into your being from the gratification you're getting from the small minority of people to make you feel so powerful you know and it's they're the things that now i think wow like how could i be so ignorant like how could i have gone through so much but it's the fact that i've been through it the fact that i've got through it and the fact that i'm ready to go up to another frequency and another level mm -hmm. is what just keeps pushing me you know i just i'm not giving up i haven't made it to where i want to be yet like i've mm -hmm. turned my life around i've made a fundamental change in my life but now it's about maintaining that lifestyle and that living and that mindset you in know positively because yeah. now there's so many people you're talking thousands of people asking you to do your book we know that's all coming your book <laughs> documentary film um, you're also going to start doing your own podcast what I'm actually bu buzzing for yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, yeah. we spoke about it the last four weeks that it's going to be amazing yeah you're going to bring in amazing. the elite yeah, some hard hitting it's, stories it's, it's about I've seen a gap in the market mm -hmm. really to be honest with you James I've seen an, I've seen a gap in the market that needs to be filled because we all need to be honest. We all need to make a difference. We all need to make a change. And I think I'm the conduit to do that for the um, the masses that need it, I believe. And mm -hmm. that's, I think with the podcast, it'll be, it'll be emotional, it'll be explosive. Do you know what I mean? It'll be, it'll be what it's supposed to be. Yeah. It, 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 it'll be a podcast for the street. You know, it'll, mm -hmm. like, it's just, it, it, it'd be, it, uh, I, I think it's going to be unbelievable. <laughs> that is going to be unbelievable. We speak unbelievable. about it. We'll not touch too much on it, but check out Marvin's YouTube channel, uh, Marvin Herbert. Yeah. You've got two YouTube channels? Was it one? Um, the, the, I think there's there's one, I think there's two Facebook pages and one one's a corporate and one's mm -hmm. a personal and one YouTube page. Yeah, is. this is going to be explosive. This is going to be next level shit. I'm buzzing for you. I can't wait. Um, it says you're a seat shit, so this is out in a few weeks, man, so get involved. But, yeah. Marv, we'll get into the nitty gritty as well. You've, like I said, the last podcast was just a roller coaster of kind of everything about you, how you functioned, how you felt, what made you strong, what made you weak, the person you become. You've been in over di 20 different prisons. Yeah. You don't think you've done a lot of bud, but to be in over 20 different prisons, mate, I think 
you're close to being a fucking pigeon, mate, the amount of birds you've done, bro. I say, um, do you know what it is? It's just, like I keep saying, it's just what you have to do at that time. And you're like that. Like, even writing down all the prisons I've been in, mm-hmm. I could, I've, I've forgot some of them because you you don't remember the ones you're in for a week. Like I've done lay downs in blocks all around, all around mm-hmm. the country and you don't remember every prison you've been in. And so you don't really mention all the lay downs. You just mention the jails where you've been on the land. That's what I'll give you. All yeah. the jails where I've been on the land. So it doesn't make sense talking about the ones where I was down the block because the block story is all the same. So, <clears throat> yeah, I've been about because... I was a subversive inmate. Mm-hmm. I wasn't one of the inmates that liked to work towards a decat or towards a home leave. I was just... A terror. I was insane. <laughs> was, again, again, right? This is what I'll say to people. Like To me, I wasn't insane then because the mindset I had back then, right, was we're criminals, right? We're fucking naughty people. We're going to prison. What do you want me to do? Be a good person now. Go fuck yourself, mate. I'm a bad man. What? Listen, I, I don't choose to come to prison every day and work around all these fucking scumbags. You do. And that was my mindset. It was them and us. I was a criminal. This was an occupational hazard and they were the enemy or an ally. And that, that was just the mm-hmm. mindset I had going through my young teenage years and adolescence. So 86 was the first time you went to the YOs, Felton, was it? Yeah. What was that experience like? Um, to be quite honest with you, I, I, I don't want to sound sort of well hard sort of thing, but it's, I can only be honest, James, right? So mm-hmm. what was it like when I first went to prison, right? My first thought when I went to prison was I've got to have it with everybody. If anybody says the wrong word in the wrong tone, it's off. It's just got to be off. There's no making friends. I've got no friends here. So anyone talks to me, it's a confrontation or it's a fight. And that was my introduction to Felton, really. Um, You go... I remember I cried, though. When they said no bow, the first time I got no bow. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? Oh, I think it was 15, 14 <laughs> or 15. Mate, I was like, what? Like, no bow. I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean no bow? What do you mean? And I was like, oh, oh what do you mean, mum? Mum? <laughs> Man, that, that was funny. Yeah. I thought, I'm going to prison. What do you mean I'm going to prison? I can't go to prison. I'm Marvin. Uh-huh. What's the matter mm-hmm. with you? Like, I, I mean, that wasn't really bad. Like, mm-hmm. what are you doing? And, uh, I went downstairs, I was in the in the um, holding cell downstairs and I cried my eyes out, I'm going to prison and then I was thinking, fuck. And then I remember the 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 movie, Scum, and I just thought, fuck it. Like the worst thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna get cut. Do you know what I mean? And I'm all right with that. Like I, I can get cut, I don't cut. I cut, I've been cut. I stabbed myself, I fell on things. And you know, you, you as a kid, you measure things up on the pain mm-hmm. and a cut never hurt. A cut was a feeling. It was like a, <sighs> that was a, when you, that, that was crazy. <laughs> like, when a cut's just like a, it's not a ah mm-hmm. pain, if that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain, but I wasn't scared of getting cut. So the worst thing that could happen to me in prison that knowledge, without the knowledge I had was that I could get, um, cut or hot water and sugar. So then I decided that I'll get a blade and I'll always have hot sugar and water. So I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna have what everyone else has got sort of thing. So when I first, I went down to the cells, I was crying and then I was in Hampstead Magistrate, I think it was. It was either Hampstead Magistrate or Juvenile Court. Where, what was it called? It might have been Wilsden Juvenile Court on Marleybone Road. Oh no, it wasn't. It was Wilsden Juvenile Court up near Wilsden it was, it was in Wilsden. And then I went from there to the holding cells in Lambeth. And that's when I fucking, I was just out of my comfort zone. There's like 45, 50 kids in one cell. Do you know what I mean? And you walk in there and I was always a pretty smart dresser as a kid. Once I started nicking money, I was wearing all the latest labels. Back then it was, um, Chevy on, Paul Smith, and the the back end of it was the back end of Chippy, and then it was Chevy on, Paul Smith, Fred Perry, 
Um, no, it was more Pringle and Lyle mm. Scott when we were growing up. Pringle, Lyle Scott. Um, Paul Smith. Amani came out a couple of years later. Yeah, so I was always in the, like, the sickest garments. I was always mm. dressed well. So when I've turned up in a prison, I always looked the part. I never looked like one of them people that was that I have not sort of thing, you know. I always looked sensible. My face was always confrontational, so I wasn't backing down from anybody. If you looked at me, I'm looking at you and I'm asking you what? What are you looking at? What? And if it's if you're like, well, then it's for fight. There was no real in betweens. It was either submission or fight. So that was my introduction to Feltham. And then you went to Hunter, Hunter come, Hunter come. Yeah, that was a, throughout the course of the sentence. So the juveniles is pretty vague for me, but I was very loud, very, very loud and very confrontational. And I had to be seen, I had to be heard, and I had to be known. So it was the same mindset I had when I first come to London. I'm in a new environment. I've got to make an impact. How do I make an impact? I make an impact by being violent and loud, confrontational and naughty. And that just gets me the attention. Um, I made a bit of an impact throughout the um, juveniles. Um, and a good thing about me growing up, it's mad because as a juvenile, I was pretty advanced. So 13, 14, 15, my mates would be 17, 20, 23. Like some of my mates are 10, 15 years older than me. Do you know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. So when I was 13, 14, 15, my mates was 18, 20, 30 sort of thing. It was like really weird. But I am going to apologise because there's a quite a few young men that fell victim to becoming addicted to drugs because of me, I believe. Um, because when I first got to Feltham and places like that, they never heard of crack, heroin, ease and powder. Like they, they, they was just all smoking weed. And I was banged up with a, a few kids from over Tottenham. It was me, Mark Lambie. Weng Weng, um, me, Weng Weng, Granty, Lambie, me, Granty, Lambie, and Weng Weng, yeah. Weng Weng. Weng Weng, his name was, but it was all, it was in a four man dorm. And uh, I was, uh, I come off a visit, and my pals would come up, and it was when the ease, the rave scene was going off, so. When they were, we was all partying on the outs, so on the weekend, my pals would bring me out a few ease, a bit of sniff, a bit of crack and a bit of heroin. So then I'll come back to the cell. Now, I was what you class as a cockney kid, right? So all the raggers, the be, they were call them raggers because they were just ragamuffins. They'd, some of them was African, some were Jamaican, but everybody acted Jamaican, right? But um, they all spoke patois and put on accents whereas I was always spoke normally so I was banged up with all the little raggers like Lambie and all them like, with the little bad men from Tottenham and that yeah so like when I'm banged up with them they're all smoking weed cess like they're getting a little 10 pound drawers so I learned very quick in prison that you make friends with drugs so I was always my older brother was a, a, a bird head my mum was on drugs, my sisters was on drugs, my brothers were on drugs, my friends was on drugs, so getting drugs wasn't a problem. So I asked for my parcels, my parcels came in, so I'm sitting with all the raggers, smoking, crack, they're like, what's that? I said, oh, this is free, because it was called free base back then, I said, free base and just free base and a bit of coke, mate. And they're like, what's that, what's that? I'm like, cocaine, they're like, oh, we don't touch that, we don't touch that. So I said, I'm high now and I've got to come down, so I boot a little bit of heroin, and they're like, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's heroin, bring you down. They're like, wow, what, do you do all of that? I was like, yeah, and then roll a joint after. Do you know what I mean? Like, that was my normal at that age. You know what I mean? I've been smoking crack and heroin for four years up until that point. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was like, Sick. and the older people I was hanging around, they was all doing it. So I introduced a lot of the class A drugs into the YOIs in Feltham. I'm not responsible for all of it by any means, but there's a few... Like, there's a few kids, a couple of kids from Battersea that um, fell victim. Do you know what I mean? My pal's little brother. Nah. There's a few people, you know, one of my, a couple of my pals have died. We all got caught up in a world that we thought was good and great and mm -hmm. mature and we didn't realise the consequences. Uh, what that were you coming. like when you were clucking, if you never had anything? I never really clucked. Like, I weren't... It was kind of weird because... I weren't... As mad as it sounds, 
I weren't a junkie, although it sounds crazy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds mad, right? Smoke, coke, I'm smack, on. weed, yeah, all in fucking five minutes. I'm I'm you were. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look at yourself as a junkie. Yeah. This, 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 these, these were social acts that people done in certain environments yeah. that was accepted. Do you know what I'm saying? Then so, wasn't as bad that all those drugs were just coming through in the 80s. They, they were and all, you got to think, of, I'm, I'm easily influenced by mm -hmm. all the older lot. So all my older lot are doing all these drugs. So mm -hmm. to be like them, you just mimic. And that's all it was, you know. Um, yeah. And How the fuck was your head been bang on if you were smoking the coke and then coming down with the fucking heroin and then on the weed? He must have been fucking all over the place. But you know, so you, you, you say, I, was, I was, but <laughs> you don't, you, just, you don't think you are. Yeah. Like it was just the normal, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was just normal. That was normal. That was normal. It was just normal. Yeah. That it's was, scary to think for such a young boy, 15, 16, to be doing that in a cell, isn't it? It's scary. Yeah, but that's what, that was a, see, then it became more of a, it's a social thing so at the end of the weekend and then it was too much so then I started throughout my sentences I, I, I partied once a month so I mean and then I stopped smoking heroin stopped smoking crack there was sort of frowned upon through I'd say the late 90s mid 90s it was starting to get frowned upon because that's when New Jack City came out crack was getting frowned upon so it wasn't a good thing to be smoking crack so I wasn't one of them people that was hooked on things forever it was just i done things it was cool to be done at that time sort of thing so yeah. um come the early 80s early 90s mid 90s crack wasn't an issue heroin wasn't an issue it was more about um getting money then more money more sustainability you know yeah grand uh, moving up the ladder when you uh, come out and stuff were you dabbling when you were out or was it just a prison thing no it's just you come out and you take drugs anyway, don't you? You go out, you take a few E's, have a sniff. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then if you get too wide, then you have to take Valiums or something like that to bring you down. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. the drugs have always, well, they always did play a part until I left this country. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because the normal environment on the weekend is everybody parties. Every like Even all the people that work, they go out and have a drink. All the people that have been grafting, they go out and have a sniff. All the people that go out and have a party. So everybody's out on the weekend. So yeah. everything in this country is geared towards the weekend and having a party, mm -hmm. you know? So it's hard to sort of get away from it totally. Mm -hmm. And that's why yeah. moving out of the country. What was Warren Hall? Like 87, 88, you were there? Was that still Wyo's? Yeah, it was still Wyo's. Um, well, back in the 80s, the prison was pretty much um, black and white. Um, and then the mixed race people just sort of never really fitted in. We weren't black and we weren't white. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of mixed race people in the system, three or four that I know, me included, that was just off the hook. Do you know what I'm saying? Like just always crazy behaviour, mindsets, doing the craziest stuff, fighting, stabbings cuttings, hot waters, always fighting the screws. Like, there weren't a week that went by that I never had a drama in the prison. Do you know what I mean? I never had a week where there wasn't a nicking. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. even towards the end of my sentences, like, I got released from the blocks. Like, it's, do you understand? Like, yeah. I'm getting, I've got two weeks left on my last sentence and I ended up chinning and head butting a screw because he got cheeky. I mean, the mindset is, oh, you, what, you finally intimidate me a week before I'm going over. You think I won't fucking smash your face in, you cheeky cunt. And then, boom, they carried on. And then, boom, 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 they get their head fucking smashed in. But he thought that he was going to get me extra bird. He didn't realise that I'm going in front of an adjudicator. So, bang, when I go in front of the adjudicator, I plead not guilty. I'm getting out in three days. Do you know what I mean? They can't bring me back for that case. Mm -hmm. They've got to release me. So, unless they deal with that case there and then, they can't, and they've got to rejoin it for a month for the Judea to come back. So it was case done. So the screw was gutted, but we got an hard in. <laughs> so you done them and you got away with it? Yeah, that was only one. Yeah. Only one. Can Camden Prince, was it Camden Palace? Camden Palace. 89? Camden Palace, 89. Oh, that was uh, my introduction to the... Big Boys Jail. Big Boys Jail, yeah. That was um, allegedly, I, 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 allegedly what happened... Um, there was a bouncer on the back door of Camden Palace. Um, it was alleged that I ran up to him 
Um, I've tried to shoot him with a sawn off shotgun. The sawn off shotgun hadn't worked. He's um, took flight. While he's taking flight, I was supposed to have pulled out another firearm and let a couple of shots go at him. Um, he got into the club. I was supposed to have left then. Um, miraculously, about half an hour later, I got stopped getting out of a car about two and a half miles away. Um, police, armed old bills, freeze, don't move. Anyway, I've give, I've done one, got, got away, um, got through the back of my ass, got through the flat, and then basically got nicked about 200 metres, about about 200 yards from where I was nicked, they found a 44 automatic and a shotgun. <clears throat> um, and then I went on remand for that. That was 89. Yeah, and then I ended up, I ended up in Feltham. I went Feltham. Yeah. Then Brixton after that? Yeah. What was Brixton like? Well, again, it's the same as going to Feltham. But the only difference was now, nah, it's men. So we're going up the ladder. So I'm not letting no man tell me, fuck all. Yeah? I'm the man here. I don't give a fuck. And then that was it. Just went on a landing. I just had it with every, anybody that confronted me. You know, like, I was, I found it was only, the screws. I never had eggs with the inmates. The inmates I was sweet with, it was just screws. So you weren't allowed to talk on the landing. You weren't allowed to talk when you're walking around the yard. You weren't allowed to do certain things. But I was like, fuck them, mate. I'm talking, I don't give a fuck. I'm doing what I'm doing. And they come, I said, what? Fuck off. And then they'd kick off because I wouldn't listen to them or, do you know what I mean? So it was just ag, Brixton. And like, they'd do things like, come off a visit one day. He said, put your feet either side of the box, spread your bum cheeks and bend over. I said, bollocks. So it kicked off, boom, 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 ended up down the block, um, three days CC, back up on the wing, do you know what I mean? Back up on the visit, feet either side of the box. I said, it ain't happening, mate. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. It kicked off again. And then that went on for a good few weeks until they just said, Herbert, you know, you got to die. I said, I ain't doing it, mate. I ain't doing it. I ain't ever doing that. Yeah, if you want to spread my bum cheeks, cunt, then you lay me down, you hold me down, you fucking spread them. I ain't spreading my bum cheeks and bending over for no man. Well, I'll take my ideas every fucking visit. I don't give a fuck. And then they put me on clothes visits. It was just loads of little fucking things to drive you mad mm -hmm. and like just... Did they ever just wrap you up and kick fuck out you? Yeah, a few times. Like it was just... Mm -hmm. Prison for me was just non-stop conflict with the screws. So... And that, them, them stages of my life, it was all conflict. No, I, I, I weren't trying to make friends with the screws. And then uh, all that did change a couple of years down the line when I met a couple of old villains from over South London. They sat me down and gave me a bit of information. And I started doing things a bit differently <laughs> from that day. But to me, it was the screws and us. So if you spoke to a screw, you was a cunt. If a screw comes to your cell like a friend, then you was a grass. So I wasn't into making friends with screws. So anyone talking to screws, to me, was a screw boy. So I was very aggressive, very confrontational with people who thought they were sensible. I said, you ain't fucking sensible, you fucking rat. You speaking to the screws? You speak to the screw. What's he standing outside your door for the, uh, half hour for? What are you speaking to a screw for half an hour for, mate? Like, what the fuck? Do you know what I mean? Like, I could never understand why people befriended screws. And then, obviously, I started learning about parcels, products, all sort of bits and pieces coming in and out of jail and the only people to bring in was the screws and that weren't until 96 that I found that out <laughs> so up until up, up to 96 I was just a mayhem in prison just anti-authority yeah anti-authority subversive mm -hmm. after 96 that was it it was different different playing field mm -hmm. you know what I mean because you realize it to your advantage yeah it's just what I learned is this from a young guy and well, he's an older guy like me Mickey Cunningham and he said, he, he sat me down one day, he said, Marv, why did you do this? I said, well, yeah, I don't give a fuck, mate. I don't give a fuck, mate. <laughs> fuck him, fuck him. He said, he said but, Marv, look, no disrespect, mate. He said, but you're the only one staying here. They're going home. And they're laughing about you when they go home. 
right? And they'll come in tomorrow and they'll wind you up. So you explode again and then you lose some more days. And then you stay here longer. How about your missus and your kid? Like, don't you care about them? And I was like, what are you talking about? Of course I fucking care about them. But I'm not having this cunt say this and this. And he went to me one day, he said, Marv, I think you got it backwards, you know. He said, think of it like this. You're naughty and you get caught and then you come to prison. Be good so you can go home to be naughty again. He said, what's the point in being naughty and not going home? It don't make sense. I don't understand it. And, uh, and then that was the one bit of information. And then uh, Mick was the guy that always grafted. He was always a graft, always doing everything right. So I was like, why'd you do this? Why do you, he said, what do you mean? He said, I'm out of my cell all day. I'm grafting. I'm doing this. I'm going there. I can go there. I can go there. I can do this. I can do that. You're banged up all day. And I started thinking, oh, all just because he speaks with a couple of screws. So then I started learning from Mick on how to sort of get my own way with the screws on the wing. And then things changed after that sentence. And the next time I went back to prison, it was more about offering opportunities. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever have, have any respect for your elders in prison? Or was it just you wanted to be the fucking the main guy? You wanted to be the Don? There was a few people that I come across. I won't mention their names because they might not want their names exposed. I don't know where they are right mm -hmm. now in their lives or what they're up to. But, um, yeah, there was a couple. There was a couple. There was a couple. Um, Parker, there was a couple. There was a couple in Swellside. A um, couple in Maidstone. You know? Ah! Um, yeah, I remember... I don't know, I don't know, it's fucking Raphael Rowe. Yeah, the yeah. guy who does the Netflix documentaries. Yeah, see, I've got to apologise to this guy, you know. Have you? Yeah, because I fucking, me and my pal served him in Maidstone. We attacked him in Maidstone because we believed he was guilty of his charges. And he was in the gym one day and we walked into the gym and he was working out and my pal said, get off the fucking bench, mate. What did they get charged with? Oh, so it was all sorts of madness. It was. It was murders and all sorts of crazy stuff. But he got acquitted of it. So we can't talk about what he got acquitted from because we reacted because he we thought he was guilty and he wasn't guilty. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I've watched a couple of things that he's done on the telly Seems now. Seems a nice guy. And yeah, what I'm saying, he weren't that. He ain't that guy. Like he mm. ain't me. He ain't another version of me. Whereas when he was away, I I don't know why, but I just believed he put his accent on because he's always spoke like pretty calm like he's always mm -hmm. been a calm guy like the way he, but the way he presents his shows and stuff he is like that guy mm -hmm. but I always thought it was an act you schemy little scribing cunt he's not very and it was just and then when, when in the jail we attacked him and I actually felt fucking really bad the other day when I see him on the telly I thought that's oh, mad yeah. I know that geezer because he's done 12 years for yeah. a murder he didn't and do you know what he got he got, he, he got some ag in there you know because I, 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 I was I was I was wild in 94, 95, like wild, right? And he wasn't received well in Maidstone. I was in Maidstone with him and he wasn't received well. And then because my mates never received him well, I actually went out of my way to make sure, like, you, what, you can't fuck him. Like, you're just very aggressive, very confrontational and just made his life a fucking a living hell for a period of time. Or I would imagine every time he saw us coming or saw us on the exercise, he was thinking, fuck, here we go again. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And he hadn't done nothing. So I'd like to apologise to him. Yeah, um, if he clear. contacts me, Marvin at the MarvinHerbert.com, email me if you can. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it'd be nice to catch up. That'd be honest. some story, mate, to talk about that. Yeah, no, but you, know, you do, you meet people along the way, you know, yeah. like, I've had, I've had some conflicts throughout the prison system. That, nothing really terrible bad way you want to kill people but you know just fisticuffs growing up mm -hmm. having a couple of yeah. like I've never really I've never had to throw hot water or oil over anybody do you know what I mean uh, I've always been the fighting man I have straighteners yeah. with people put the gloves on or fuck the gloves or if there's two or three people in a cell I'd go in the cell and have mm -hmm. the fight in the cell with people yeah. you know I had Yami B on the podcast a couple of days ago he speaks very highly of you <laughs> Yami's done over 46 years in the jail said one day you were just coming in I think it was maybe in the 90s, he knew you, he knew your brother, who's got a bit of a reputation, and yeah. he says, yeah, Marv's a real deal, he says, there was a couple of big guys, you were fucking putting it on them, and Yami thought, he thought, you were going to get done, 
and he says, "Oh, fucking take them in the shower." Yami's got a couple of tools, and before he could come in the shower, the two of them were lying spark out on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Yami's fucking off. He's not. But what a story, man! Great guy. Is this what is this story? Yeah, that was. I don't. I, I, I can't. I, I, no one got knocked out on that story. Mm-hmm. Though. No one got knocked out. But what happened was there was a couple of brothers. There was a couple of who was in Swellside, ninety three, ninety four. And basically what happened, um, I was a, I was a, how can I put it? I'm just one of them happy, bubbly, having a laugh, giggle, getting a drink, getting a bit of gear, having a party prisoner. I wasn't a, I've got to be a good boy to get out prisoner. I was grafting, I had to get money for my missus, money for the kid. Like, mm-hmm. no, you're grafting, you're making money, you're, you're trading bits and pieces, you're getting through your sentence, right? So I was always like, uh, my mum bought me drugs, my family bought me drugs, my friend bought me drugs. I got, if I had money, I'd get money sent out, I'd get, I'd get what I wanted in jail. What was your weight in that like? Were you still training or were you thin? Yeah, no, I was, I was pretty slim growing up as a kid, but I was always fit. I was always fit and I was always... Um, Wiry, sharp, fast. Always, I've always boxed, so mm-hmm. i always done circuits, always done things like, see, there's men that I've come across with are more powerful than me. Men I've come across are stronger than me. But unfortunately, they haven't got the engine. And that's what keeps me or kept me victorious along my journey because I had a good engine. So I could take an idea and if you couldn't last more than a couple of minutes, you are fucked. Do you know what I mean? So you mm-hmm. can punch my face, you split my eye, bust my nose, punch my mouth, punch out my tooth or do whatever. But if after that you're fucked, then you're in trouble. Do you know what I mean? Because I yeah. can take that. So mm-hmm. my goal with people was always long term it wasn't always just a, a, a two minute fight so I I, 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 I was physically mm-hmm. so you able. shouted these two brothers into the changing no, no, room I'll, tell you, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the story so we've had a party right? I've had a party on the wing there's me rest his soul Fox Shakesy um, Colin oh mate Meeky oh Colin um, Fox Scatter it was me Fox Scatter Shakesy, Colin, Burger, and someone else. Anyway, we're in the party, we're taking loads of these, we're all raving, we're having the right mad night. All of a sudden, it was canteen. So the screws have come down to knock on the door, to say, you lot got, all the canteen's been done, you lot are the last ones, come and get your canteen. So we've come out of the cell, out of our nuts, all buzzing, laughing, joking. Got like the land, got our canteen, come back. So when we've come back now, we said, it's bang up. So I've said to everyone here, here's a bit of puff, because it's my party, here's a bit of puff, here's mm-hmm. a bit of gear, see you in the morning. So we goes about our business. A um, couple of days later, I've run out a bit of puff. So I'm thinking, who's got puff on the wing? Ah, Burger, Burger will have a bit of puff. So I run up, I said, Burger, do us a favour, you got a bit of puff, mate? He's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, like, I said, give us a bit of puff so I'll get my visit. Now, what I meant by that, yeah, was, Give a bit of puff. I'll give you a little bit of puff back when I get a visit, right? That wasn't give me a bit of puff back. I'm going to pay you twenty pounds when I get a visit, right? So in my head, because we're all trading little bits, I thought uh, it gives a couple of joints. I'll give it back to him when I get a visit. Not a problem. So all of a sudden, I've come back on my visit one day, gone in my cell, and my door's gone. Now I'm like, who the fuck's at my door? Like, because only the cats get people knocking on the door as soon as they come off a visit because you usually go on the numbers or fucking don't pay you or do whatever. So this gives I said, what's the matter? So he's got to be, have you got that bit of thing? I was like, because I'd, 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 I'd actually forgot at that stage that I got to give him something back, yeah? So I went, what thing? It's like, that money for the bit of puff. Because I don't buy gear here in jail, yeah? Only... Cats buy gear in jail. Do you know what I mean, we trade everything in jail. You don't buy it. I don't, you don't go, mate, you got any puffy eyes, 100 quid. You don't do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've done it, don't get me wrong, but it's not protocol. Like, you do it to get on your feet when you get to a first jail. I'll give you another story about that in a minute. So, basically, um, I've gone to him. He's come, he's come and sell, like, what's happening with that thing? I was like, what thing? He's like, a bit of scratch. So, for what? He said, a bit of puff. And I was like, Right, give me a puff the other day. I was like, rah, what, are you coming to my cell? I said, go upstairs, I'll come up and see you in a minute, mate. Stop driving fucking mad, you know. So I've carried on doing what I was doing. And then I'm saying my mate, my mate went to me, well, he was at the party the other day, innit? I was like, yeah. 
do you know what? You're fucking right. What am I paying him for? So I run up the stairs, yeah? I've gone in and said, I said, bruv, what are you playing at? He said, what? I said, you come down my cell after my visit and you ask me about where's your scratch. I said, you got, you got a party pack the other day. I said, you got a bit of gear? You got a bit of puff? You got a pill? Are you paying for that? I said, what the fuck? I said, how can you tell me? I've got to pay you for the puff, mate. But where I'm sort of, I was very irate when I was a kid. So that was done at uh, Oxen's a lot higher. So I would have been screaming at him when I'm talking. I used to scream at people. All of a sudden, he's looked over my shoulder. As he's looked over my shoulder, I've gone like that. Now, his older brother, who's a, who's a proper lump, standing behind me with a big metal frying pan. So I was like, what the fuck? I said, we got going to do me over the back of the head with that. He was like, no, nah, don't be silly, muff. He said, I just heard a bit of commotion. I said, fuck off. I said, well, you didn't know it was me. You're trying to tell me you didn't know it was me. I said, you fat cunt. And I've, I've had a bit of a screaming match. He said, what have you been like that for? What have you been like that for? Ah, oh, you're a fucking mug. I can't remember exactly what got said, but there was a bit of a confrontation anyway. And I went, oh, you're a fucking, anyway. I can't remember what I said exactly, but we've parted. And then um, we've gone to the gym because everyone used to go to the gym on a certain day. So we've gone to the gym the next day, but then you was allowed to box in the gyms. So when we've gone down to the gym, him and his brother, uh, yap, 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 yap. So I just thought, well, do you know what? Let's see how we yap, yap, yap with the glove on. I said, look, all this chat, 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 chat you keep giving about, you're going to knock me out, yeah? I said, put the gloves on, mate. Let's have it. Let's keep it simple, innit? He was like, yeah. I said, yeah. And that, obviously, he don't want to put them on, right? But now the jowl's got behind him. Come on, muscles, man. Can't let this skinny you them there, there. Because now I'm only little. I'm skinny, innit? So how you let, how do you let skinny Margot boy cheat you like that? Nah, man, you got to knock his head off. And I'm saying, bruv, I don't care if he knocked me out. You can knock me out. No ill feeling. Promise you. Come on, let's have it. Have it. I said, I'm going to make you punch out your asshole, man. Watch, you're going to be vomiting, you fucking mug. You're a fat cunt. <laughs> anyway, you know, after about 15, 20 minutes, he's been put on him. So he's gone, boom, boom, boom. He's actually put the gloves on. So he's put the gloves on. He's haymaking all over the gaff. I'm bobbing, weaving, bop, 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 bop. Do you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, went to work on him. Done me bits. And uh, as always, I think that put me up the ladder a little bit within that environment because he was, these brothers was sort of feared by a lot of the young kids in the jail. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because they were a big lumps. Do you know what I'm saying to you? But I wasn't ever scared of people. I was always confrontational. So you had to prove yourself to me. I'm not going to listen to other people. If you kick, punch my head in, you punch my head in, it's not a problem. But you have to prove that to me. I don't take someone else's words because they say you're hard. I'm going to go, yeah, he's hard. Would you shake their hand if they beat you? Fair yeah. and square? Or would you go back? Yeah, and no, no. It's, it's one of them, when it's over, it's over. And do you know what, Sam, would I shake his hand? I don't know. Because I've never been put in that position. I've never been in that position. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So yeah. I'm one of them people, I won't give uh -huh. up. I won't yeah. give up. Like, what was Yami like? Yami's like my brother, man. He's mm -hmm. just, they're just wild. What it is with Yami, Yami's, uh, he's like my old self on steroids, if that makes sense. Like he was in prison, yeah? He was a bigger figure than I was, right? In prison. Because in prison, he made an impact in certain jails and he'd done certain things. So he was just wild. Him and my brother were like hitmen, weren't they? They used to just take contracts on everybody in the dispersal. So he was just wild. He was just off the hook. And he, yeah. Yeah, over he, 46, 46 years. And we had him on a podcast when he told his story, man. It, it's difficult as well, even though the damage that he'd done, to, but he was abused and stuff as yeah, a kid. Yeah, man, powerful, the man. painful like stuff, man. And we met and we've spoke a few times, man, and you can't help but smile when you speak to him on the phone. He's yeah. such a bubbly character. He's been through so much, yeah. though, do you know what I mean? And mm. it's like, I think he's like myself, he's worked himself through the insanity back to normality, do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, And he's making himself whole rather than just product of his environment you know because yeah. then, then like that much that bird does it does have an impact it really does have an impact do you know what mm -hmm. I mean like you can't not go through all of that prison sentence and not be affected like that's wow. a hell of a lot of bird man do you know what I mean like I've only I don't think I've done a lot of bird but 
it's affected me and it affected me when I was a kid growing up in all the sort of uh, unexpected of places. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, because you don't understand you're insane when you're going through all that stuff. You don't realise what you're doing as being insane. So your normalisation of the crazy stuff is what makes the transition sort of... It made it easier for me, I think, because it was easy for me to say, fuck, I was wrong. Fuck, I should have listened. Fuck, I can't do that no more. Do you know what I mean? Like, you get to a point where you know, what's the point? There's no point in it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, when you're growing up, you're trying to fit in, you're trying to make a name for yourself, trying to make a future for yourself, there's a point to taking a risk. There's a point to cutting corners. There's a point. Do you know what I mean? Because there's a chance you're going to make it. But when you're sort of 40 odd years of age, 35 years of age, 40 years of age, and you've got kids, you've actually really got to consider what it is you're doing and how you're doing it rather than just going out on a limb and egotistically doing things because it pleases other people, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the madness about living that world, that we lived it for everybody else, for everybody else to make us feel good with that emotional gratification, you mm -hmm. know? In 93, you get done for robbery. What was the robbery? That was a security van. Ah. That's uh, 1993, July. We got nicked on a, on a... on a bit of work we weren't even supposed to do. That was a bit of a mad one. But that was... I think... That sentence there was the one sentence that actually changed the direction of my life. How come? Because I think if I never got that sentence, I might have been a junkie. Do you know what I mean? I might have been a junkie because I was partying, I was sniffing, I was drinking, I was intoxicating myself with any substance, but, but speed. I would never take speed for some reason. I couldn't, I had to go to sleep. I was always one of the people that had to sleep. So speed wasn't a thing I took, amphetamines wasn't a thing I took, acid wasn't a thing I took. So stimulants and sedatives is what I sort of worked on, like really aggressive stimulants and mm. really... Bring you down. Of, yeah. yeah. So that was my world, that's all <clears throat> I lived for. So when I got the, the five, that was my introduction to the gangster world. That was when I thought, right, I'm a gangster. That's it, I'm going, we're nicked for a van, I'm nicked, we're going to Scrubs. And on the way to Scrubs, I, my, my co-defendant, Timmy, I said, Tim, that's it, mate. I said, when we get here, no bollocks, we've got anybody, we'll do this, we'll do that. So it was just, we're two young wire eyes. We'd lied about our age. So I went, I'm not going, this is the mindset I had. I'm not going to a wire wise, nicked for a van, you're mad. I'm a man now. I'm going to a big man jail. So I lied about my age to go to Scrubs. Um, yeah, and it was just... What I'll do, I'll just go through a few stories yeah, while yeah. I'm in my yeah, brain cool. now, right? So this was the mindset I had when I, when I was... Right, so I'm 20 years of age, nicked for an armed robbery. My, my, my bird's nine months pregnant. I'm nicked on the Wednesday. My son's born on the Sunday. Um... So now I'm in jail. My head's been fucked. I've been smoking, partying, taking loads of ease. Me and the missus had dramas, split up. I've been nicked. Life's fucking turned upside down. So now I'm in scrubs. So the first night I'm in scrubs, I'm banged up. I can't remember his name. Some, some big fella, white fella, white lump, nicked for armed robberies or something. But he had the most immaculate cell I had ever been in up until that point. And all his bits and pieces, yeah. It was like a house. And I've never seen a cell done up like that. You see a couple of them in wire wires, but nothing like the men's jails, right? So I was like, I banged up with him. And I've, I'm I banged up for the night. I'm lying on the bed, right? So now, this was, <laughs> I'm lying down. I've gone, uh, I said, here, mate. I said, uh, any chance my, my, my Cody can come in this cell tomorrow? What do you mean? I said, can I have this cell for me and my code? 
was like, nah, mate, this is my fucking cell. Can't see, I've done it up. I ain't moving. I was like, ah, oh, all right. All right, sweet, not a problem. So then I waited, the next day I've come out. So me and Tim now, we're talking, how are we going to get banged up together? So we're trying to work our way out to get banged up together. And all the cells are taken. We're on A-wing in scrubs, on the freeze. No, we was on the fours at first. So we're trying to get a cell together, can't get it. Anyway, so Tim's saying, I'll speak to you. Like, my cellmates are trampy. I don't want to be in here. Let's, oh, we've got to get your cell. We've got to get your cell. So I was like, all right. So speak to your cellmate over banger, right? So I'm like, sweet, sweet, sweet. So we banged up and uh, put that story on pause for a minute. Back in the day, in in prison, you used to have a Roberts Rambler radio and they used to take PP9s, which are square batteries like that. Like they're square all the way around, right? Three inches all the way around. People used to put them in pillowcases to whack people on the head with them as a weapon, right? So uh, we banged up. Now, this geezer must have been about 20 odd, 30. Like, it was a proper face in the, in the jail. Everyone knew him. He had all the bits, all his canteen. Like, he was a proper settled prisoner. But what, what I call institutionalized prisoner, right? So, back, banged up now. So then, um, it's, it's a lunch bang up, and we're coming out at 1 30. So, I remember banged up behind the door. I just laid down and thought, how am I going to get this geezer out? So, I, was, I said, do you know what, mate? I ain't being funny. I said, me and my pal need to bang up with each other. I said, you need to move out of this cell. And he said, listen, mate, I'm telling you now, yeah, I ain't moving out. So if you want out of here, you got to move out, mate. I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do now. I'll tell you what we're going to do. And I've jumped up. She said, yo, you go to sleep tonight, cunt. I'm going to get a PP9 in your face as soon as you go to sleep, mate. You want to do something about it? Do it now, you cunt. You fucking cunt. And he's like, what have you been all that for? I said, get up, come on. I just, no, just, I just confronted him. Anyway, cut a long story short, he's like, oh, all right, don't worry, don't worry. You, can, you and your pals can have the show. It's not a problem, it's not a problem. So I was like, all right, sweet. So I've laid down, wait for the door to open. So the door's open, 1.30, I've gone in Tim's cell. I said, right, I think he's going to have it, you know, I think he's going to have it. All of a sudden, oh, but can he read? Screw shouted us. I thought, what's that all about? So we've been called into the office. So I've gone into the office, screws, four screws in there. Said, listen, this ain't YP's here, you know, Robert. I said, what are you on about? He said, look, you're going to get yourself out here. I said, in what way? He said, you can't be threatening people. These are big men and you're going to get yourself out. I said, I don't know what you're talking about, Gov. What on earth are you going on about? He said, you threatened your cell, mate. I said, for what? I said, I ain't threatened him. I was asking him if, Tim, if me and Kenevi can bang up together. He was like, well, listen, that ain't going to be suffered then. You've got to mind yourself because you're going to get yourself in a bit of bother. Blah, 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 blah. Give it all that chat. You've got to be careful then. Men this, men that, men this. I went, all right, sweet, not a problem. So I've gone back in the cell. The geezer's sitting on the end of the bed. I said, you think you're clever? So wait till you go to sleep tonight, you stupid looking cunt. You went, me, me, I'm moving, I'm moving. You can have the cell. You and your mate can have the cell. And that, that was my introduction to the scrubs. And then it was just every day after that, Every single day, no matter who it was, screws, if a screw got cheeky, I'd try to drag him myself, or punch him in the face. I was down the block. You know, I mean, it weren't, that makes sense mentioning everybody's names, but it was a, there was a lot of boys from Stonebridge, Harlesden, Willsden, a couple from South London, you know. Um, everyone was in scrubs at them times, and I was just like a tornado. And then one, one afternoon, a couple of the older boys have called me up and said, is your, is your dad's name Barry? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, your dad's my pal. Your dad does this, your dad does that. So from that day on, I had a lot of the boys from Stonebridge and Harlesden on, on my side. So I had a bit of a decent following because now I'm a bad man's son in jail. Do you know what I mean? And and the bad man laid everybody on Cess. So I was a decent little... And you are making a reputation of yourself. How yeah. were you feeling when you were starting to build up that reputation that you were fearless powerful, and up for anything? Powerful, powerful, powerful. Within... Within six months of being in the men's, man's jail, and I'm not saying this to make myself look big or bad, I'm just saying, because this was how it was, this is the truth, and people that know me know me. Um, we distinguished quickly who the junkies were, who the sensible people were, and who the governors were. Right, So the governors we was in bed with because we knew their sons or their cousins, their nephews, their brothers. We knew people that knew all the villains. So we was accepted because we were the wild bunch of the kids. So... All the gangsters 
was on the wing. They looked after us like because we were game. Do you know what I mean? And then all the all the raggers knew me because of my dad, and it was just one of them things that the bully come out. So that was it. Now, like I'm feared, I'm respected, I'm known. So now I started making rules. So if you took gear or you took certain things, you weren't allowed to have it on my wing without having ag or without giving certain people products. Otherwise, it was ag. And it was just one of them scenarios where it's just anything to create trauma. So if someone's got a parcel, who's got it? Who's got the parcel? Right, guy saying, bro, what are you doing with that parcel? You know you got a bus that, innit? They're like, what are you talking about? And have to uh, and take their parcel. You know, so... I was a horrible bastard in the early years of my sentencing. And I was, I'm embarrassed to say that I was a bully for the wrong reasons. Do you know what I mean? Like it was just, I'd say it's even hard to explain. It was just, I refused. Although I took drugs, I disrespected junkies. I don't know, I suppose it's, 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 it's uh, an association with my parents or my elders or whatever, but anyone that was a junkie, I, I despise them and I hate them. And they just, they just give me the ump. So I used to just pick on them. And I was an horrible cunt. So. Yeah, but it's because you were seeing yourself in them. Maybe, maybe. Do you know what I mean? They didn't want to accept that you had become what you'd been seeing your whole life. Mm. As it had addiction problems, anger, frustration. You just became a product of your environment. See, you don't even realise it. Yeah. yeah you're right mm -hmm. and that was it and then obviously because of all the violence the screws it was just the reputation grew and grew because I was I was just fearless so if a screw says I, I wasn't scared to smash a screw in the face and spend two weeks down the block like because I was going to fight every day down the block you know so it was just one of them things you fight all day and have a giant go out of bed yeah. fight all day have a giant go out of bed that's all it was it was just like getting through the days with madness what did you do after that five after the robbery did you have a spell out the prison yeah um, from 97 from 97 to 2002 was just like a whirlwind of criminal behaviour just madness like there, that's I think there was, I don't know, I can't even remember how many shootings we was under investigation for, how many we got nicked for. There was just so many, but I remember, what, what I can say, there was a list with 24 people on the list and 19 people on the list had been shot or killed. Do you know what I mean? And that was all the investigation, the, the conspiracies I was nicked for, all of that. Mm -hmm. And then the Dale Creek and thing. Like, so it's just... Constant. In 2002, you were charged with murder, conspiracies, shootings, Mac 10 with a silencer, body armor, mm. and you were expecting 36 years. When you 2002, what was you? Were you must have been still wild then. But what happened when you were getting charged? What were you don't, thinking? That don't, don't matter because back then it was more of a. It's not what they know; it's what they can prove. Were you at a time in your life where you were ex going to accept to be getting life at some point. Yeah, I was going to get life. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was just, it's happening, isn't it? You get nicked for them shootings, like you're either getting not guilty or you're going away forever. Did you enjoy the jail at some points to thinking it was an escape for you? It might sound crazy for people, but if it was... Uh, nah, I always you know. regretted, I always hated being in jail. It wasn't the... Uh, I wasn't one of them people that needed to be in jail when I was skint. I had friends like that. I, 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 why would you do that? I said, bro, I'd rather be in jail than be out here. I've, I could never understand that. Do you know what I mean? Because I'd rather mm. be out on the road when I'm skint so I can make some money. Yeah. can't make money. In, well, you can make money in jail, but not as not much as you can make on the air, you know? So it's just one of them things that never really stuck with me. So 2002, when you, were getting, you get charged with all that, were you thinking, I'm fucked when you were getting a 36? Um... I can't say I thought I was fucked. I actually thought, do you know what? Yeah, I was fucked. <laughs> I was fucked. When they, when they said yeah. to me, yeah, you're getting 36 years, that's when I thought, oh, I'm fucked. I'm fucked. And it was being fucked that made me move on to asking the older lot for a slot on the transport. 
So I asked the old lot for a slot on the transport so we could feed all the co-defendants throughout the sentences, considering I was getting 36 years. And they cunts sent five grand over. I couldn't believe it. So that was the penultimate turning point on the criminal fraternity in England. But up until that point, it was just madness. You know? But um, yeah, it was uh, 2002. That was another little roller coaster ride. So that was all confrontational, very violent, that sentence. There was non stop violence all the way through that sentence. Um, and then, yeah, a few, I think a couple of screws got nicked. One of my barristers got nicked, got a nine. A screw got two years, a screw got four years. You know, that was just all the. How come? Well, living again in prison, it right? Because prior to that sentence, all my other sentences have been based on just fighting and violence. So that sentence, 2002, was more on making money because I was going away for 36 years. So I needed to get an infrastructure in place to make money to pay for the next 36 years. And that was just what I'd done. So um, it was alleged that I was bringing in um, a Kia Puff, answers of brown, answers of white, MDMA, and vodka, vodka. I think one of the screws got nicked with eight bottles of vodka, a Kia Puff, and other bits and pieces, you know, but that was something that was supposed to have been coming in allegedly every month. You know, when they raided one of the wings, they found a freezer, a, 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 a chest freezer, full of chickens. And in every chicken, it was half a bar. <laughs> yeah, because that's what they had to do, apparently, mm -hmm. was, um, to to hide the, the path, they had to put it in the chickens. And then when they come on the wing, I don't know what happens. Someone must have took a chicken out, cooked the chicken, and not realised it was half a uh, bar, sure and, it, and it stunk out yeah. the, yard, the thing, and then they found the chickens. But I don't know how that come about, that they found the chicken, the puff in the chicken. But yeah. How does it make you feel as well that your barrister got a nine, some of the screws got a two and a three, who've probably got families? Well, the, the, the barrister broke my heart because that was something I begged him not to do. I said, please don't do this. Do you know what I mean? Don't, don't go and see these people. Don't do it. Don't feel you have to. Like, please don't do it. And he was like, you know, I got fucking nuts. But he was a good mate of mine, George. Mm -hmm. I was gutted about that. And he ended up in line because the fucking anyway. Because you are a, we speak all the time, we speak every day. You're, even though you're through all your madness, I see a sensitivity, a sensitivity about you and a kindness and a genuine, you're very genuine. Mm. I believe you would be there in a heartbeat if anybody had picked up the phone and phoned you. Do you know what I mean? That was so, my problem. See, that was my problem growing up. And it's the same thing that happened in prisons. So I go to prisons. And it just kicked off. Or people were getting bullied and I'd support the bully. Do you know what I mean? Or I'd support the person that was getting bullied. So he couldn't get bullied. Right? I was, that was just my flaw, I'd imagine. That sensitive side of me. Were you involved in any prison riots? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was... Every prison I went in, there was a, a riot. I think I wrote these down the other day. Let me just get this down for you. Right, so the first... The first riot I was involved in was trying to think. There was, there was a little one in the YOIs that we were in, but the first actual proper off, out of control, kicking off, fighting, blades, screws running around, running jail was High Point, 94. So that was your robbery years? When you get done yeah, for the robbery. Yeah, but that's what I said. That, that was the sentence that made an impact mm -hmm. on my character and my reputation. So what happened? I got I got I got the five and then I went eye point. So I've gone to eye point, which was known as being knife point back then. So the story was I've turned up not uh, eye point, I've got no gear on me, no puff, no nothing. So I'm I'm fresh. I'm waiting for a visit to come in. So now I want a bit of puff because we've been puff and do what we're doing. So I've tried to find the local dealers in the jail. Anyway, I found a couple of them and I've said to them, look, do me a favour, um, could you give me a bit of puff until I get my visit 
I'll double it up and I'll look after you. Do you know what I mean? But I ain't got nothing to give you for it now. So he was like, no, mate, no, mate. I was like, oh, come on, don't fuck about that. Obviously, I see myself as being sensible. So whenever I approach people, I approach them on the level that, look, I'm going to return whatever you don't think I'm buying it. I don't want to buy it, but I'll, I'll double up whatever you give me. Anyway, cut a long story short, they, they swerved me in this little firm. So then in the back of my mind, everything's game in it. So I thought, fuck them then, sweet. See how they shape up when I flood the jail, innit? So a couple of weeks later, or a week later, a few of my pals would come up. So for me, my parcels were standard, right? It was half ounce of weed, half ounce of puff, um, a quarter of brown, a quarter of white, and ten E's. That was what I had on my parcel. So they, I got them in, and then basically, because High Point was very open, you could walk about and do whatever you like, so it was easy to sell gear in there. So I got a bit more gear, <laughs> and what I'd done, because the geezers that were selling the puff wouldn't give me no puff when I first got there, <laughs> what I'd done, used to get, work out how much was it? We used to get 30 joeys out of a gram. 30 10 pound joeys out of a gram. So what I used to do, um, I used to sell a quarter of a gram for 50 quid. And I think a quarter of a gram got you saying like 10, five or 10 joeys, something like that, right? So they'd buy the, the quarter of a gram because it gives them double the amount of gear than what they'd do if they were buying a bag. So then basically I'd done that for a couple of weeks. So none of the people selling bags in the jail could sell any gear. So then a couple of keys had come to sell it over. I said, what are you on about, mate? I said, I asked you for a bit of puff when I got it. And he told me to go fuck myself, really, didn't you? I said, like, you can't sell no gear. What do you want me to do? Mm. Well, have I got to stop selling gear so you can sell some gear? Is that what you asked me to do, mate? I said, come on, do what you're doing, innit? Like, I've done what I've done and you told me no for a bit of puff. I'll see you later. Anyway, cut a long story short. A couple of weeks gone by, and I had a young... Quinn, shit, can't remember his first name. Might have even been Ian, Ian Quinn, young scars kid. But he was having it with me because he knew me brother from another jail. So he was a gearhead. So I let him look after the gear and he'd run, run around doing all the sh all the bits and pieces. Anyway, one day he's been robbed, right? So he's been robbed. So me, Gary Wilson. <clears throat> Me, Gary Wilson, Steve Mahoney, <coughs> and me, Gary Wilson, Steve Mahoney, and not Steve, because I, I, there was Steve Mahoney's my cousin, but it was another Steve Mahoney from Liverpool. I'm not talking about my cousin, I'm talking about Steve Mahoney. So there's me, Steve Mahoney, um, Gary Wilson, and one other. Mark something, I can't remember his second name. Anyway, basically, Ian's been robbed. So now I'm asking him, who robbed you? And he said, I don't know, but I can remember their trainers. If I see their trainers again, I will never forget their trainers. So, All right, sweet, come on, let's go over. So now we've got to go on, <coughs> I think there's two wings with something like 60 cells on each wing. So now I'm going to find out who's robbed my gear, isn't it? So now I don't give a fuck, I'm going in everyone's cell. A couple of people got the ump with it, but I didn't give a fuck. Anyway, cut a very long story short. We run through everyone's cell that we needed to go through. When we come off the wing, I think where we were going next, we would have found the trainers. But before we got there, all the all the fellas have come out of the wing with tools and they were expecting us all to run off. But with all because his knife point, it was called, they had a metal workshop, so you can make weapons there. So I had, I had like you know the police truncheons, mm -hmm. right? So you get. The truncheon, so you've got to fit here what you hold. Then you've got the truncheon there like that. Then you've got a knife there. So you can block and stab and punch. So it's like a knuckle duster, stabber, and a blocker. All, All in one? Yeah. And then you might add a sword. Like you have these, like you, you screw them. Like they're not like walking sticks, but they're not. They're swords. Where the fuck did you stash them? So you make them in the jail. You can make it. Yeah, all but in where the jail. did you where did you stash them at night? In your pot. No, there's loads of there's loads of different places. So depending on the the length of the blade, you could take off. Um, right, you got the U bend right, mm -hmm. in your sink, but then you got a bit that goes down the sink. So you can take the U bend off and then put. It's like you get um, paper clip, right? So you put 
a hoop through that paper clip and then you put the paper clip on the top of the the tube so the tube's like that the paper clips are hanging like that and then the blade is inside mm -hmm. the tube but in uh, it's hard, how can you explain it right so you got the string right you got you got the string that hooks over the edge mm -hmm. right and then that sits in the pipe and while it's sitting in the pipe, your blade can sit in the pipe. Uh -huh. I don't know if I'm explaining that. Yeah. So then basically when you unscrew it, you pull the paper clip up and uh -huh. then you've got the knife. Do you know what I mean? So you can hide them anywhere. And in them days, you used to better move your bed. So you put them up the bed leg, screw the bottom of the bed leg back on. Do you know what I mean? You can take your lights. You've got uh, the light. You can unscrew the light. You've got these three pins. So you've got three pins in the, in the, in the, in the screw. So you get a bit of plastic, you melt the plastic, you stick the plastic into the um, pinhole and then it goes hard and then you just turn it and you just end up making screwdrivers out of plastic. So you, you can hide them, like there's a million and one places to hide stuff in prison, mm -hmm. but you can hide everything and whatever you don't hide, you keep cheat. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I used to have a little blade that I had in my cheeks every day. Do you know what I mean? And had, you had, at them days you didn't have a phone though, but you just had your parcels and that up your ass. But yeah, every, you hide them anywhere. Or, or what you do is where you associate. So where, where you walk around the yard, there's loads of concrete. So you just pull the, pull the mud away from the concrete and just put your blade down there. Mm -hmm. So you've got blades all parked up all around the place. Mm -hmm. So you just run and get one if you need it. So, so you had these tools you were going to go and cause it? Yeah, yeah, we went around terrorising everybody, searching for these trainers. And then all the geezers come out of the wing to have it. And it was just like a running battle on the... On the, on the South side it was, yeah, on the south side because you had north side and south side. So the south side of the new block, there's the south side of the new block. All the all the fellas come out and it just just went nuts for about fifteen twenty minutes, and then all the inmates fucked off, and then all the screws come out and they carted us off, and that's when I went Parker. So that's when I went Parker, but that was the first riot, and then um, when was the second one? Second one was was it swell side? Yeah, because we had Bedford swell side high down. Yeah, we had one in swell side. There was a mini one, not a riot, but there was a mini little kick off in the man. So the next one, the next one was swell side. So I'm in Swell Side. It was after the fight with them brothers. Um, there was a little Irish firm on the wing. And basically, the Irish, I got on with the Irish lot. Um, but a couple of the Irish lot was doing business. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know what the conflict started over, but there was a conflict with the black lot and there was a conflict with the Irish lot. And there was in a bit of conflict. But because I didn't like some of the black kids, yeah, I sort of pallied up with the Irish lot. And then basically, because I had a row with the two brothers, the Irish lot believed that the two brothers was really hard. So I'm saying to them, they're not, mate. They're not. They're not hard, mate. Trust me, you'll be able to do them. Don't be scared of their size. Come on, man. I've had it with a pair of them. Like I've moved about, da, 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 and I sort of give them a bit of confidence. And they just come, <laughs> just come out, and it just kicked off on the wing. And... um it was, they called it a race riot, but it wasn't. It was just someone had a product, someone didn't want to pay for it, and it just kicked off, and I was instigating it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> just instigated yeah. that one. Um, what was it like when you got out, when you got a five, you are expecting a 36 wreck, you got a five and came out. How was your mindset then? I've got to get out of here. I just had to get out of England because... I don't know if you remember on the third podcast I said that when I went to bed that night before I got the sentence, yeah, I don't know whether it's the spirit guide, my, my, I don't know what it is, but a little a, a voice, a man, a, a, I get a vision in my sleep, and he just said, "You're not going to do no more than five years in prison." Like these voices, then I listen to them. Do you know what I mean? So I always knew I wouldn't have to do that bird. I always thought I'd be on the run. So when I actually got released, it was like. Fuck, what is this voice I keep hearing? 
what is this voice? And then the voice at that specific time said, you know, you've got to leave this country, innit? So I was like, yeah, don't worry, I'm going, innit? And I had to convince Zoe to leave. That was hard work, but we've done it eventually. But yeah, it was just, I had to get out of the country. So when I got out of prison, I had to get out of the country. That was my only aim and goal. Mm -hmm. So I see my license out and I've got to leave this country. I mean, because this is what I'm saying to you. I get information from the universe and I know I've got to do it. Do you know what I mean? The problem prior to my transition was I focused on the wrong products. Do you understand? So yeah. I was focusing on criminal activity, violent activity, dangerous activity, when I needed to focus on helping activity, growing activity, positive activity. Now I do the latter. Do you know what I mean? My life's going in a phenomenal position mm. and in a phenomenal direction. So I know I had the wrong products at a previous stage of my life. Yeah. You know, so even today, there's a big difference in you from today. You're more calm, fresher, you, you're relaxed compared to the first one. The first one, you were kind of on edge, not on edge, but you're, you're very emotional. You're, you're, I don't know if it was because you, you know, your story was going out to the masses. It can, maybe... I think it was more about talking about my parents. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it was, I never want to put my mum and dad over in a bad light because they'd done the best they could with what they had, right? And because we was growing up in an environment that was very racist and very ignorant, like we was all fucked from the start to be fair, do you know what I mean? So I never wanted to put my mum and dad over in a bad light. Like I've always said, I've always loved my dad and I've always loved my mum, unquestionably. Like, and I don't blame them for what I went through do you know what I mean? Because I know I made the choices to do what I done. I know my mum and my dad didn't want me to be a criminal. They didn't want me to go and do what I done. Because all my other brothers and sisters by one are all legitimate. They're all straight. They're all good people. Do you know what I mean? I was the only one that was off the hook. You know, so I know they didn't want that for me. And they tried their utmost to prevent me becoming the person I did. And they failed in that. Mm -hmm. And that's all I can sort of hold them accountable for is failing controlling a lunatic yeah. how was how is it talking about all the prisons you've been in looking back and on reflecting on it all how do you feel um do you know what it's it's just a journey i don't feel anything about it now you know like because every sentence i went through like for say, <clears throat> my first sentence i went in um, I met some South London people. I was in Rochester. I was in Huntercombe. I was in Feltham. I was bubbly, grafting. We was in with the, the, the car thieves, the burglars, the robbers, the drummers. And I was just mingling, mixing, growing in that environment, becoming that person I've become, you know. And I was learning the best from the best in that environment and the worst of the best, you know, the, the sickest of the best. I was learning what to avoid and what not to avoid. Do you know what I mean? So it was just all a learning curve and a learning institute I used it for, you know? And it was just, every year was progression for me. So these lot, oh, they're, they're only car, they're only burglars, they're only this, and they're no value. I want to be with this one. These lot are the, um, aggravated burglars. Oh, aggravated. I don't really want to wrap anybody up. I'm not into that. I don't want to hurt people. I just want to get some money. Yeah. And then do this, ah, oh, the jump ups, the jump up delivery vans, ah, oh, they're sick. But then it's, fucking headache selling all the products after it's a load of bollocks so then you're not you don't know how much you're going to get what am I going to do fuck it how about nicking the snap so the snap we started nicking the snap for a little while you used to get five five hundred and forty pound a box I believe I think it was five hundred and forty pound a box of fags so you get I think it was Five thousand. I'm not sure how many you got in a box, but you got back then it was five hundred and something pound a box. So it might have been five thousand snap for five hundred pound. It's crazy. But yeah, we used to get five hundred and something pound a box of snap. So we used to get all the delivery snap delivery trucks and then it went up to the money delivery trucks. And prison was always an occupational hazard. So going through the sentences was just helping me climb the ladder. Mm -hmm. That's all it was doing. You know, and every job I went to, I learned more from the higher up the ladder criminals. Yeah. So prison was just a learning mm -hmm. institute for me. How did you feel being on the podcast the first time and making world headlines on the world news about your story, being out there and being connected to Daniel um, Kinahan? How is that story for you? Because well, you've been in the papers for murder, guns, all the fucking heavy stuff to then having a positive story. Well, that's the thing, right? Because 
it was it was a an absolute milestone for the Irish media to write something positive about me. And what they said was a um, gangster turns advocate, and then they, and they had a four page write up, and it really shows that I have actually changed and that I mean it and that people are listening and people are paying attention and people are actually acknowledging the fact that I have been through so much trauma and it was an excuse to get away or do what I've done, but I've done it because that was what I had to do with that still. But I've changed, I've turned my life around. I'm fighting everything I can fight to help others grow, you know? So it's a win-win. So I was I was blown away. I was blown away. I actually emailed the journalist thanking her for her, her spread in the paper and the fact that she put me and Daniel over in such a positive light, you know, because like I said, like without Daniel, yeah, I wouldn't be walking. I wouldn't be here. Like people don't understand, like he never financially paid me to do anything or done anything so I could live and grow and do everything, right? But the mindset, the conversations, you know, like even not paying for everything in the bar or paying for things in the restaurant, running up bills, like just assistance in living. Do you understand? Like supporting mindset. Like when I wanted to get my leg chopped off, I was sitting down with Daniel and I was in so much pain. I was suffering so much. I just wanted to get his leg chopped off. And I said, I'm going to have it chopped off. And he said, don't. Don't, mate. And obviously, he's looking at me retrospective of what I've been through. Looking at me thinking, wow, look, you can't get chopped your leg off. So I'm saying to you, like, once it's gone, it's gone. Because I... He said, once it's gone, it's gone forever. He said, Marv, man, give it a year. Just give it a year, see why you're being a year. And then I'm so glad I did. Do you know what I mean? Like, because I don't know what I'd do without a leg now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying to you? But yeah. it's just, I think about it all the time now. Mm-hmm. Although he gets so much bad press, he's done nothing but help me become the man I am today. And I've got nothing but gratitude for that man and admiration because we all get bad press, innit? Like, look what they said about me in the paper. If you believed everything they said about me in the paper, why are you telling me I'm such a fantastic guy? Why am I such an amazing human being? How, what, I'm the only human being that can have this transition. I'm the only human being that has this badness. No, we've all got history. We've all got skeletons, <coughs> you know, and the media has a funny way of putting things out to make people look worse than they actually are for media purposes, you know, but we're all men, we're all humans, we all have emotions, we all have hearts and we all have a life and responsibilities. And what I learned from Daniel is how to be a man. And whether people want to say bad things about him for that, that's their business. But I always thought a man had to be hard, a man had to be violent, a man had to be this, a man had to be that. And people like Daniel told me, no, a man doesn't get angry. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, a, a man's someone you can rely on. A man's someone who's there for you. A man's someone you can, who will support you. A man's someone who's there to give you advice. Like, men are men. That's what a man is. Like, a man's full of responsibility. And, and like, men are not wild. Men are not, they're, that's kids. They're young men. They're adolescents. You know, a man's by definition, not by opinions, you know, and, if you're not looking after your family, you're not looking after yourself, you're not looking at the ones you love, then you're not that man. You're not that man. If your family are relying on you and you're supporting everybody and you're protecting everybody and you're feeding everybody, then you're that man. Then you're that man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you can sit down in any crisis, any situation, any drama and navigate your, your people through that issue, then you're that man. If you're the man that wants to stab, shoot and kill people and go to prison, then you're not that man. Mm-hmm. Do you understand? So what is a man? A man so that needs to be on the street every day for his son or his daughter. 
A man is a man who's got to be there every day for their family. A man is someone who's going to be there to support you in your time of need. That's what a man is. You can't do that from prison. Do you know what I mean? And these little things that Daniel instilled in me has made me become the man I am today. Now, I don't know what people's opinions are of Daniel, right? But I know he's got some skeletons, like I've got some skeletons. But fundamentally, he is a good man who's been transcending to a perfect place since I've known him. Like I've, he's never spoke to me about criminal activities. Anything I've ever spoken to Daniel about is about legal products. It's about growth. It's about infrastructure. It's about sort of, how could you put it? It's just principles and morals. Like, I used to believe, right, just, I used to believe that all the people in London, Liverpool, Manchester, I've grown up with, loved me. They loved me, unquestionably. That's what I believed. They all loved me. And we've all got mad respect. And until I met Daniel, I never realised that it was all using me. Do you know what I mean? Like, how do they love you if they're going to let you risk your liberty and go to prison? That's not love. That's not a friend. What friend would you go and put in prison? What friend would you go and risk their life for? Who would you go and ask to risk their life for you? Who would you ask to do that yeah, for you, no Marvin? I'm like, no one. He said, well, that's because you they're your friends. They're your friends, so you're not going to ask your friends to do that, are you? And I was like, wow, this geezer is deep. And the more I got to know him, I started realising that a lot of the stuff that they print about him is bullshit. Just like the stuff they print about me is bullshit. And mm. I just hope and pray that someday soon it all comes out and he gets reborn like me. And it's not a religious thing, it's just a spiritual thing, you know, because he's an amazing man. He really is an amazing man. Like, and I, I admire him more than any other man I've come across in my life. Because when we spoke on the first podcast, when you spoke about the time you were shot, the emotion that you had speaking about that no one came to visit you, that really affected you, eh? Oh, like you couldn't imagine. You know, and this... What I don't want to do is get emotional every time I speak about a certain yeah. product, right? So it's when you're prepared, see, even when I go to say it, I start feeling myself welling up. Mm. You know what I'm saying to you? Because it's just deep, man. When you're prepared, when you are prepared, when you, 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 or anybody else, when you personally are prepared to die, to go to prison forever, to get stabbed, get shot, get beaten for that other person, like that's what I'm gonna. It's gonna. I'm gonna accept that for you. That's what I'm doing. For, I'm gonna sit in prison for you. I'm gonna sit in prison for you because you're my pal, and you're helping me out. And I'm not gonna let that happen to you. So when I realised that I was just being used, I felt, I felt hurt, not only because I was used, but the fact that I was just like a prostitute, just thrown to the gutter for nothing. Like, that's it. You just, you don't mean nothing. Now that's the, it's not meaning something to someone that, that hurts. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's not so much anything but that. It's just the fact that I never meant nothing to them. And, I was prepared to die for that person. I was literally prepared to die for that person. Like, I'm prepared to die for that person. Like, I'm going and I'm going to get shot at. I'm going to get stabbed. People are going to boot my door off. But I don't give a fuck because you're my pal. Come and let's deal with it. And then realising they're not your pals. Like, hmm. and the, 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 I'm, going to, I'm going to say it. I can't remember if I said it in my last one. But the one thing that done it was that I was driving home from the hospital one day and I seen one of my oldest friends who I've been in so much dirt with, we've been involved in so much bollocks from when we were kids. And the only reason this man could be where he is on that day is because of me and my pals were looking after him, surrounding him like a fucking uh, force field and living in his life. And I see him 
And I pulled up, all happy to see him. I was like, oh, what's happening, Dolly? You all right, mate? And he's like, oh, what's happening? I was like, straight away, right the, the welcome I was supposed to get. I was like, what do you mean? It's like, fuck. And he was like, wow, oh, Marv, I'm sorry. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you up to anyway? And there was just no, there was no come with me. We're going to look after you. Like, where have you been? Like, there's, there's no caring conversation. And all of a sudden, his brothers called him. He said, hey, Donny, your breakfast is getting cold. He went, Marv, I've got to go and have me breakfast. I'm sorry, mate. I'll give you a bell soon. I'll speak to you later. I was, I was like, wow. Wow. Like, and my pal's dead for you. My other pal's in prison for a long time for you. There's people that have been stabbed and cut and beaten for you. There's lives were ruined for you. For you. No, for no one else, for you. And your breakfast is getting cold. You horrible cunt of a man. And I thought, you know what? Leave you to it, mate. And that was the day where I sort of severed my emotional ties to the criminal fraternity. Yeah, London. and I think for anybody watching, it's a good example to understand that in that life of crime, there's no loyalty. No, there there's was no, no love. There's no trust. The only the only loyalty is to the pound note. Okay, the loyal to the the only law to do that. Mm -hmm. The law to do that. The law to take. They're the best thing since sliced bread until they take. When it's time for them to give. No, they're not about yeah. they're not about. Let's touch on the things that you do for the kids, helping others, putting a bit of positivity back into their life. Yep. Of kids not to make the same mistake you've done. If anybody's going to listen to anyone, they're going to listen to you because you've lived that life. So how did you get in about trying to help the youth? Um, that just happened naturally, basically. It's just, I've, I've always done it, basically. It started off in Spain. MGM and it started off with a boxing and it was I've just got away with the youngsters do you know what I mean I suppose without sounding too cliche-ish I was one of them hard nut violent scary type growling intimidating people that kids warmed to and I don't know why they warmed to me but they really did so I had an influence over the youngsters to listen to me to do the training a certain way. So I had the youngsters doing training like professional boxers, do you know what I'm saying? So our elite level of amateurs was elite. They went on to win the, the Spanish national champions in lightweight, middle, middleweight, cruiserweight and heavyweight. Do you know what I mean? And they, they've done that within two years of boxing. They won the national championships in Spain. So it's always been in me to bring out the best in others. Uh, I've, that's just something I've always done. I've always helped others. It's just a, a mm. quality skill that I've had. So I always get involved in adding value to people. So people that know me, people that watch, and people that will comment, they'll say, yeah, it's true. Marvel's that guy. Like, I'm adding to your party. I'm adding to your life. I'm adding to your product. I'm adding something to it. Do you know what I mean? I'm not there to take from anyone, you know? Mm. So... The helping aspect of me has always been part of my sort of build up, I think. Yeah. You've got big plans for the future. Book, documentaries, films. You're coming to do a documentary with me, the Ayahuasca one. Yeah. We're taking five of the naughtiest men in the UK, take them on a trip on Ayahuasca. How are wait. you feeling about that? It's, always, it's just going to answer all my questions, Joe. Yeah. And hopefully we're going to get it raw footage and everyone's going to see the the dark side of ayahuasca mm -hmm. and what it does and what you've got to go through. Painful journey. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I want to say, I'll, 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 because I'm saying it now, right? That I do believe it's just going to answer all my questions and tell me that I, I know I was right sort of thing because it's mad. Like I get told stuff and when things are happening, when they're going to happen and it happens. So I believe that I'm going to connect to the universe for the first and final time, do you know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. going to be the one and only time that I've ever connected to it and then that's it. There's no there's no looking back, James. Yeah, it's a painful experience, man. I was in hell, I was terrified. You're saying you'll thrive on the pain because you've always ran towards the pain. That's what I'm saying, I'm not. I'm, I'm the opposite. <laughs> so if it was painful, I was involved. Yeah. If it was stressful, I was involved. If it was frightening, I was involved. And I had to show you, you I'm not scared. 
So if someone says to me, Marv, there's 30 kids coming down here to serve you up on Friday, I'm like, yeah, sweet, come on then. Let's go and see. Like, I'm not running. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's been situations, even the prison stories, right? There's a, in the man that 15, 20 black geezers come out to serve me up one day, rushing me with blades and all that, and I never run. Do you know what I mean? I'll just stood there ready, come on, come on, for me, Mr. Roberts, another couple of people, and they just froze. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've had it with 5, 10, 20 screws. I've had it with 15, 20 police officers. I've had it with 5, 10 people, 15 mm -hmm. people, 14 people. I've been stabbed, shot, beaten. I've done it all. So the physical aspect of pain doesn't consider, there isn't, isn't a consideration for me to worry about. It's just part and parcel because in the moment, nothing hurts. Mm -hmm. So nothing matters. So we're going to do what we're doing because we've got to achieve a goal. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? How true is it? A lot of people have been messaging, talking about the business, the film, that, that Tamar Hussein's character is kind of based on you, that part of lifestyle, doing what he's done over there. Violence. Generally, it's just, it's just one of them things. It's just, it, I can't say it was, it was based on me, but it's based on a mindset of person. Do you understand? So the types of people that were doing that sort of stuff were the person that I was. And that's how simple it is. Now, Tamar and everyone, they've got their um, history. They've got their closets. Do you know what I mean? They've got their skeletons. Do you know what I mean? They've all played their part somewhere along the line within the platform. Do you know what I mean? And they've all made choices relatively a lot sooner than me to make a change. So it's just everybody's associating my mindset to what they're seeing because this is the mindset that they make the movies about. This is the guy, like, it's not based personally on me, but it's my type of person. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There's only a certain type of us, there's only a certain amount of us of this type in that world. And I'd say, it would, I'd say 2% of the criminal fraternity is made up of people like me. So anyone that's similar to me, that they, like, they make a book about. Do you know what I mean? They'll think, oh, that's... That's similar to Marvel, that's similar to this one. It's similarities, you know what I'm saying? But with me, because I was just, I was, what's it called when you self, I was, I just, I just knew what I wanted to be and I wanted to be the naughtiest person. So I was just obsessed with being the naughtiest person I could be the most yeah. was there a time when you thought you were in Marbella and you were making some money you thought I've made it and now looking back you're thinking I, I hadn't even fucking started yeah I, was always, I, I, I felt that all the way through my life that I'd made it do you know what I mean when you're nicking a couple of hundred grand off a van or when you nick 100 grand 50 grand 70 grand when you're getting 250 bits home like you don't feel like you're failing do you know what I mean you don't feel like oh my life's getting hard here I'm never going to crack it like I've never ever believed that I'm ever going to be skin, because that when I think about being skin, I think, well, I won't be skin because I'll just go and take that, or I'll rob that, or I'll take this, or I'll do that. So, I mean, there's always an option when you're a criminal because it don't matter because there's always a target, whether it be a criminal target, a legitimate target, or a business target. There's going to be a target out there. Like, if I can say, the criminal fraternity is, if you give me the ump, then you're a fucking target when I've got no money because you give me the ump. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to teach you a lesson for giving me the ump. So you get saying, oh, I want, I'm fucking taking it. Or I'm going to set someone on you to take it. But I wasn't that guy. I was the guy that was, I got my own shit. Do you know what I mean? I never really robbed, well, I've never actually robbed anybody of anything apart from one guy, Roy Barr. I robbed him when I was a kid because he niggered me off and took the piss out of me in school growing up as a kid. But I pulled his pants down for a bit of graft back in the day. But apart from that, I've never really robbed anyone. Um, a few drug dealers I used to refuse to pay and knock them out or do bits and pieces like that. But I've never actually went out of my way to rob people to benefit materialistically or money-wise. It was always taking drugs off people. Hey, why am I paying a junkie? You're a junkie, but boom, I ain't paying you. I'll take that. See you later, fucking dickhead. So that was my mindset. Do you know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> the association to me is different to some types of criminals because I was every type of criminal. I wasn't a type of criminal. So I was game to fight, stab, shoot, rob, steal, but no nonsense kidnapping or women. Mm -hmm. So anything, but I was in it. So, and I was good at what I'd done. Yeah. So going forward, brother, part two is done and dusted. Yeah. Smash that again. 
what's your plans then? Tell me how you're feeling today and going forward for the future. Do you see big, happy, positive plans? Yeah, it's always, it's just, to be quite honest with you, James, I think I'm going to have some form, some form of TV show in the next five years. I think we're going to have all sorts of programmes developed, all sorts of learning programmes, all sorts of teaching programmes to do with music, football, media, boxing. You know, like, these kids need to understand they've got skills, they've got qualities, they've got opportunities, you know, and it's about getting as many people as I can plugged in to my network so they can succeed. And that's all it is. So I'm looking for as many people as I can. We're starting mentoring, so I'm going to be training young men to be younger versions of me mentally so they can go on and mentor young kids not to do the madness that we've done. Um, and then we got training for that. we got training for roofing, bricklaying, household, sort of, you know, like all the... Joinery work and yeah, stuff? Yeah, calm tree, brick laying, mm -hmm. all that. We've got, we got um, courses getting set up as we speak now. So we're going to be training people for employment. But we're going to be employing them because I've got a roofing company, I've got a scaffolding company, and we've got um, a general builders. So the three types of builders we need, we're going to give training and jobs to. Trades. Yeah. That's and good. then and other kids that want to set up their own companies, we're going to engage mm -hmm. with them to set up their own companies, whatever they need to do, you yeah. know, it's just... It's we, good, man. That's all we can do, though. That's yeah. what I wish people had done with me when I was a kid. Do you know what I mean? Because like I'm trying to show kids now, right? if you focus on sort of legal products, yeah, like you're going to grow. You're going to be successful. All I do now is I involve myself with anything legitimate that makes money. And all my products now are legitimate. I've got no illegal products to deal with. And you've got a lot more people to communicate with, with these legal products, and you've got a lot more opportunities to sell these products. So just find the right product for you. Find the right product for your environment. Find the right product for your social landscape. Because everybody needs something. Everybody needs milk. Everybody needs butter. Everybody needs cream. Everybody needs hair gel. Everybody needs toothpaste. Everybody needs soap. Everybody needs deodorant. Do you understand? Everybody needs perfume. Everybody needs clothes. Everybody needs food. Like, what the fuck do you shave all that down and say, right, bran, white, ease, and crack? Mm -hmm. What the fuck? You're giving yourself the minimum amount of products to become successful, yeah, in the most volatile environment, yeah, of risk and deprivation, and yet you choose to do that rather than going into a legitimate world, which is bright, airy, spacious, sort of free, yeah, do you know what I mean? And a more variety to choose from. More variety, more opportunities, more growth, right? And no headache, no prison. Do you know what I mean? Like, the only reason you can go to prison if you do fucking something stupid. Yeah, but I think if people think they do a bit of graft, it automatically makes them a bad man, it automatically makes them a gangster or a fighter. When you know yourself, the majority of people who do graft are fucking idiots. They are. Do you know what I mean? They ain't got a fucking set of balls between them. Obviously, and there's a few big players, but... It's I limitless. think my personal opinion on the criminal fraternity is this. Since the late 80s, all they've been producing is drug dealers. Right? Because in the late 80s, all the pickpocketers disappeared. Early 90s, pickpocketers basically gone. Mid 90s, yeah? All the burglars are going now. Do you know what I mean? All the oysters are going. All the shoplifters are all junkies now. Do you know what I mean? Like, shoplifters back in the day, like the oysters, were proper getters. Do you know what I mean? They used to got all the suits, all the cashmere, all the bits and pieces. Nah, it's all junkies nicking all that stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like, they've took away parts of society and just replaced it with drugs. Do you know what I mean? Like, the criminal fraternity had trades. You had a trade. You was either an oyster, you was a slider, you was a burglar, you was a fraudster, you was a robber. You was a brass, you was a clipper, you was loads of different things. You could choose whatever you wanted to profess in, you know what I mean, and become the best in that game. Now, nah, it's either a drug dealer or a junkie. That's it. There ain't no real in between. Now you've got the cyber fraudsters and the super fraudsters, do you know what I mean? But the book and card, every day, shit going out. Nah, the kids are just using these cyber things and doing all this online banking stuff. 
mm. online fraud shit. There's, there's no real interactive criminal activities no more. Do you know what I mean? So things need to change. So the kids yeah. need to change. Otherwise, they're going to be double F. Yeah. Last question, brother. A last wee bit of inspiration for anybody that's watching, maybe going through the transition, maybe in the game, looking for a bit of inspiration in and out of the jail. Somebody that's gone, it knows it's not quite right, but they don't quite understand if they're making the right choice or not. What advice would you give for anybody that's in the struggle just now? Do you know what? The only adv- I, I, I got asked this question because people send me up and said, I've had a few messages that people need a bit of advice. And, and the only thing that I can actually advise anyone to do, right, is go to the gym. And I mean it, James. It's not even a joke. Like, when I've been at my lowest, my most vulnerable, my most depressed, my saddest, all the deepest, darkest moments of my life. Yeah, the only thing that's raised me up out of all of it is the gym. It's the only thing that gets me out of anything is the gym. Because when I get in that gym, maybe it might just be me, I don't know. But what I'm going to give you a bit of information now, right, that I believe that everybody misses. And it's just fundamental in our, in our existence, right? We're, as a species, we're designed to hunt. We're designed to chase, carry, kill, and fetch. That's what we're designed to do. So years ago, millions of years ago, we was meant to go hunting for hours and days. So you got a family of five, right? Up to the age of 24, right? So you got a 24-year-old kid, 20-year-old kid, 18-year-old kid, 16-year-old kid, 14-year-old kid. Then you got a wife. Yeah, your oldest kid's got a couple of kids. You, your middle kid's got a couple of kids, right? You've got a couple of kids, so you've got grandkids about. Now you've got to go hunting. You've got to feed everyone. So what are you catching? What are you killing? How fit do you need to be? How strong do you need to be? Okay? And this is the thing that fundamentally humans are forgetting. No one's fucking hunting no more. So all these hormones that you're getting, all these emotions that are building up, all these sort of the breakdown that like people now all the fits everyone's getting this um, epilepsy has gone through the roof over the last five years but I believe it's all the e-products in the food the body's getting the wrong hormones the body's reacting negatively and it's shaking people down because the nutrients in our food is gone right plus we're not we're not um, exercising to facilitate the nutrients we're just eating when we're hungry and what we're eating 98% of it is poison for a human system so get on the plant-based diet, right? Like they always was back in the day. Do you know what I mean? And stop eating acid, sugar, dairy, red meat, and you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. So get in the gym, acid, sugar, dairy, red meat, you need to stop eating, and things in your life will change. So I'll give you another bit of information. I've got to give you this now before we go on. All right, so when you're hungry, when you're hungry, and this is to everybody, right? When you're hungry, what's the first thing you, you think about? Food. Right. But what food? Junk food. Food you like. Mm-hmm. Right. Everybody thinks about food they like. No one feeds about thinks about what food or nutrients they need. They think, oh, do you know what? I think like, mm, I think like, mm. And then they eat a bit of acid, a bit of sugar, a bit of dairy. And then the brain says, where's my nutrients? Where's my nutrients? So you eat a bit more food. The brain says, where's my nutrients? I've been chewing a little while now. I'll tell you what, let's set up some acid because there's a blockage. There's your heartburn. So when you start getting heartburn when you're eating food, that means you're eating all the wrong food. Right, because your body isn't getting no nutrients. You need to eat the nutrients your body needs so you can grow and develop perfectly. We're not eating the right food to grow perfectly. Mm -hmm. We're eating all the negative food and expecting our bodies to grow perfectly. And when they don't, we go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh no, you know, you're just depressed, take these pills. Oh no, you're anxiety, yeah, take these pills. No, it's not anxiety. It's your body saying, where's my fucking nutrients? Where's my nutrients? Where is it? Where is it? And you're like, oh, I'll have a cake. I'll have a biscuit. Mm -hmm. I'll have a biscuit. Oh, I'll have a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Where's my nutrients? Where's my nutrients? Oh, fuck. Oh, I feel shit. I feel shit. And that's all it is. Mm -hmm. And people don't get it because they don't get what their hormones are. Do you know what I mean? It's like, your feelings are only a, a suggestion. Right, they're only a suggestion. So you get a feeling, like for argument's sake, right? And I want you to touch, put your finger, the minute you get hungry, where's your stomach? See? Yeah. Where, point your stomach. 
Why? You're wrong. Your stomach's here. What do you mean? That's where your stomach is. Here? Yeah. Your chest? Yeah. Your stomach starts here. Your throat? Yeah, your sarcophagus starts here. Here. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why when you get that food, you taste it. Mm -hmm. Right? It's here. Your stomach starts here. It starts here. And it starts expanding here. Right? And then what it does, when it gets heavy, it sits on your large intestines. Mm -hmm. And that's what pushes out. Your large intestines push out. Yeah. But that's not your stomach. Your stomach's up here, bro. Yeah, I thought the stomach was no, that's what belly button. No, that's what people mm. don't get. Because people need to understand their bodies and what their bodies need so their bodies will respond positively. Now, because our bodies need dopamine. Now, everybody's replacing dopamine with their phones. Because every time you get a like, you get a dopamine rush. Yeah. Right, so this dopamine stuff is what you get from feeling good. Right? So how you feel good is by exercising. Because mm -hmm. then your body says, oh, yeah, like we've just run, we just hunt, we just chase. Then you come home, you have your protein. Your body thinks, oh yeah, everything's working right now. Mm -hmm. Everything's working right now. Everything's sweet. Everything's sweet. You go to the gym in the morning, you have a workout, workout, workout. Your body says, right, I need protein, we need fiber, we need sustenance. You come home, you have your sustenance, your fiber, your, your protein. Your body says, ah, oh, amazing, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. You get up in the morning, same thing again. Right, the minute you have shit, shit food. Your body says, ah, oh, what's that? You should have a shit drink. You have a shit couple of joints or anything. Your body says, ah, oh, can't be bothered doing that now. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So yeah, you, actually, yeah. you actually suppress your own emotions mm -hmm. by eating comfort food. Yeah, you are what you eat. Yeah, you uh -huh. are what you eat. Mm -hmm. So now what I eat is bare energy, protein, life, and plants, man. And yeah. That's it. I was being as healthy... The healthiest version of me I can be. Mm -hmm. That's all I can be, James. You know Love what I'm it, saying? brother. That's all we can be. Marv, as a pleasure. absolute pleasure as always, brother. Make sure you check out Marv's YouTube channel because his podcasts are going to be sick. Um, Instagram, we'll leave all the descriptions. Get in touch if you need to ask him any questions. But again, brother, phenomenal. Thanks again. God yeah, bless. Coming. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.